But let's let's do some tier ranking on soda while we, while we before we start. Yes, let's do some tier ranking on soda. Um, we're live, by the oh, way, man. Nick. Are so, we? Yes, I oh, just turned it off. Yes. So, hi, I am Patrick, and I'm Nick, and this is Dialectic Chaos. And last time before we got into our um, our metal discussion, we talked about pie. And this time, let, let's talk about sodas. Let's talk about the best sodas. Um, now, Nick, we both just agreed, because he was just drinking it, and I was just drinking it, Diet Dr. Pepper, S-tier soda. Absolute S-tier soda. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the soda. absolute bomb. It, it's... it's, it's uh, uh, yeah. It's just good. It's in the high. It, it's tier. better than regular Dr. Pe- Pepper too. It is better. Than but regular Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper is also high tier. Regular Dr. Pepper is probably A tier. Um, also S tier is Code Red. Code Red's really good. Code Red's really good. Is it but you know, we also need to include a bunch of like, like any artsy fartsy root beer. Oh yeah, S-tier. exactly. Okay, so we're completely on the same page here. We're on the same page here. Yeah, there's not what's, much of a debate. What What's your opinion on cola? Um, cola is a solid B tier. For me, cola is lower. Honestly, the only colas I can get behind are like the cherry or vanilla colas. Like, well, see, I, I like cola with other stuff in it. Exactly. I like cherry coke, but I, I don't prefer a cherry coke. I would rather have a coke and put grenadine in it. Or a Coke and put lemon juice in it. I could, I could see now, that, but I would prefer a Pepsi with cherry and vanilla. That would be my Coke cola if I were going to go for a cola. Well, I, I also think Pepsi is better than Coke, and I know we're going to lose a ton of fans for that. <laughs> Dude, but, Coke um, is so bitter. So I, I do want to preface with the fact that I exclusively drink diet soda now, and I drink it by the boatload. Yeah, I, I drink a lot of diet soda. I drink more water. I'm still basically a water guy, but I enjoy diet soda as well. I, I recently quit regular soda for diet soda. And what I've actually found is that what's even better than pretty much every diet soda is Monster Ultra. I was not a huge energy drink guy prior to, to switching to diet. But like the Ultra Monsters... With no sugar, no carbs, no calories. There's so many good flavors of them, and they're all delicious. I'll give them a try sometime I need an energy drink. Those are a little intense for me most of the time. <laughs> I, I, I used to be like, it, it tastes like candy. The pink one tastes like the pink Starburst. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm mostly, I mostly drink water. And if I'm not drinking that, I'm probably drinking tea. And if I'm not drinking tea, then I'll drink giant soda. And then... Very like once in a blue moon, I will indulge in either a code red or like a craft root beer, <laughs> like a fancy root beer or a fancy. Root beer. Yeah, th- th- this is similar to me, except instead of um, the tea, I will take uh, you know again, Monster Ultra. That's my my coffee in the afternoon. That's like my one, one o'clock with lunch at work. I, I pound one of those. Okay, I'll, I'll actually nurse it through the whole day. What's Let's talk. You know, you know what the lowest tier of soda is probably though lemon lime sodas. Just- I actually like a lot of lemon lime sodas. I mean, okay, I don't like Seven Up. I think Sprite is mediocre, and I used to like Sprite. Sprite's fine. And regular Mountain Dew is not good overall. It's weird because almost every like variant of Mountain Dew is good, but regular Mountain Dew is not good. Yeah, regular Mountain Dew isn't great. Diet Mountain Dew is pretty decent. Baja Blast is great. I'm sorry, you cut out. What Baja you say? Blast. Baja Blast is the shit. Yeah, Baja Blast is amazing. Okay, which is better though, Baja Blast or Code Red? I'm gonna say Baja. I, I can respect your opinion, but I disagree with it. It's got to be Code Red for me. That stuff is basically carbonated. I, I also, <laughs> I also like uh, Voltage. I don't think I've That's had the blue voltage. one. I don't think I've had voltage. When I, when I was in college, voltage was my jam. I drank a lot of voltage in college. Yeah, I remember you drinking a lot of voltage in college. I but I switched to- from the voltage to the diet monster. I was drinking like Lipton iced tea at the same time. <laughs> you remember that? I know. <laughs> I know. You, you'd have your iced tea, and I'd have my my voltage. And I would have my and then very the same sandwich over and over again with <laughs> with feta. Honey mustard, green peppers, onions, uh, shredded lettuce, 
grilled chicken on an Italian roll. That's, that's how you Meanwhile, for me, it was it was a take five and salt and vinegar chips. <laughs> All right, let's get into <laughs> let's get into eighties metal now. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about eighties metal. We'll spend a solid first five minutes talking about soda. <laughs> but anyway, the main topic of our discussion this time is hidden gems of the 80s, right? Um, so yeah, so we got, we got to preface this. Like we, we, we're not going to talk about bands like Merciful Fate. You know, if you're, if you're a metalhead, you should know who Merciful Fate is. Yes. In my opinion, there are some of these bands um, which are a little, I don't know, I wouldn't quite consider them hidden. Um, but I guess but they're bands that people people these days don't know about, or if you're not them, really yeah. deep in metal, yeah. you don't know about them. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. So so there are borderline okay. cases, but we might as well bring up the borderline cases. The fact is, the borderline cases are usually the best bands on this list. <laughs> yeah, um, the, 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 there's one album that is like the objective best of this group of albums, and it, it's pretty borderline of a case, but. Wait, wait, To wait. be fair, Darkness Descends, man. Oh, Darkness Descends? No, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. Also, Dude, Dark Gene Day- Hoagland's on that album. No, nah, I'm going to give... I'm, I would give probably the best to... I don't know. It's tough. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> okay, so while we're here, let's talk about Darkness Descends. We've yes, already dropped sure. the name. Let's, let's talk about Darkness Descends. So Darkness Descends is a thrash metal album from the 80s. It's kind of the second wave of Bay Area thrash uh, from a band called Dark Angel, not to be confused with Death Angel. Dark Angel's first album, Darkness Descends. That's their first album, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's better than anything Death Angel has done, and Death Angel's pretty damn good. Death Angel's pretty but, decent, you know, but Dark Angel's way better than Death Angel. Yeah. Um... You know, Dark Angel has Gene Hoagland, who would go on to be the drummer of Death, and he'd go on to be the current drummer of, of Testament, as well as Death Clock. You know, he, he's been called the Atomic Clock. He's one of the, the most precise time drummers in the uh, in the industry. Not to mention, he's got a wicked double kick. You know, he's got these really heavy, pounding double bass uh, style that just, you know, is fantastic. And uh, the real stick out on this album for me is the title track because it's just, it's very similar to what you'd get from Pleasure to Kill off of Creator's uh, album, the same title track deal is it's just got that obscenely heavy chorus with some wild vocals that shoot up into the high tier of the guy's vocal range and it'll just stick with you for days despite being immensely heavy. For me, it's got to be Merciless Death that is the best uh, track on Good Darkness Descends. But Darkness Descends as a whole, it's very much... They're aping Slayer. How do you ape Slayer? Slayer's already ape. <laughs> That's what yeah, they're doing. Uh, so this, this is aped Hellawaits, basically. They took Hellawaits yeah. and they made it darker and heavier. <laughs> but also with a completely different vocal style. Like I, I would say that... I, I'm sorry, I don't know the vocalist of Dark Angel's name. Um, he, he's got a, a much more proto-John Keeble voice. He, oh, yeah. he really has got a... Like, it, it's kind of like if John Keeble tried to sing Painkiller. Yeah. Um, and Death Angel... He, he's not like creator. Death Angel good. had an in- interesting progression. What do you think of later Death Angel? What do you think of Time Does Not Heal? So my thoughts about later death, De- Death Angel or Dark Angel? We're talking here, Death Angel, right? Sorry, Dark Angel. I'm an idiot. I I, I, I just go. said not to be so, confused with, and then I confused them. <laughs> later, Dark Angel. So yeah, Dark Angels later stuff. Um, I haven't delved too deep into it. Um, I remember when I first heard Darkness Descends. I do what I always do, and if I find a band, I I'm just, like this band has a lot of potential. I'll watch a live video because mm-hmm. the big, biggest discrepancy between Patrick and I is I am in it for the live show, and I would much rather watch a band perform a song live. And Patrick is in it for the studio. Yeah. I'm so again, I, I watched I watched Dark Angel play live, and it was pretty good. They dropped some of their new tracks in that set list. They played 
Merciless Death and Darkness Descends, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I was really, really into the old tracks. And the live versions of the new tracks were, were worthwhile. You know, I, I think... I think it's a different singer, which I found disappointing. I think uh, Dark so, Angel should have an original singer. Because you know, because you know that uh, you know that the guy from uh, Dark Angel totally changed his vocal style. Oh, uh, he did. Yeah, yeah. On on time does not heal. He's singing the whole way through. Oh uh, well, maybe, maybe it's a diff- maybe it's the same guy, different voice. I don't no, know. I, I, but all I, I remember is the same guy or a different guy. But the I, guy I, I want I, I want the darkness descends to have the darkness descends voice because again, it, it was the same thing I love about Pleasure to Kill by Creator, which is my favorite Creator album. And and the guy from Creator changed his voice too, unless it's, that's a different guy. I'm not I'm not very informed on Teutonic Thrash, so forgive me if it's a different guy. But I thought the voice on that album was strictly better than anything they had done after. All right, all right. You know, Satan is real. I mean, come on. So you know what's funny? Um, your your recommendations. We both came up with recommendations for this hidden gems list, and my recommendations were almost entirely thrash, and your recommendations were almost entirely new wave of British heavy metal or doom metal. Yeah, but the new wave, the the doom metal was also new wave of. Metal. <laughs> yes, they, they, they came out of the Nawaba movement. This is true. <laughs> so, and for me, it was you know, or death or black metal. But the death or black metal I was posting was out of the thrash movement. So that's, that's an interesting. So, one. I think it's actually an interesting dynamic because if you look at the types of music we like and play, the type of music I like and play is thrash metal. Yeah. Um. And thrash metal is influenced by new album. Like I, I recommended a Tigers of Pantang album. That album is hugely influential on the Bay Area thrash. You play black metal. Bay Area thrash is hugely influential on black metal. Yeah. So uh, Bay Area thrash is hugely influential on death metal. But I mean, Slayer was influential on black metal. But outside of that, it was a lot of like weird cuts of thrash metal, like. You know, Celtic Frost, that's not Bay Area. Sepultura, that's not Bay Area. Nerf Dude, I, Bay. I'm sure, I am sure Euronymous owned a copy of Kill 'Em All. Oh, yeah, I, he totally did, but I feel like there were more. And I'm sure he owned a copy of Killing is My Business, too. Yes, but I'm sure he was more influenced by, like, Voivod, Sodom, Sepultura, Creator, all that kind of stuff. More, more yeah, than but Bay Sodom Area. sucks. I'm sorry, Elias. <laughs> Sodom isn't good. <laughs> yeah. I, I I love thrash metal. I, it's my favorite genre of, of metal. I do not like Sodom. So, so I refuse to okay. change. But I also I also had a, a period when I was a teenager where like I was going to be the technical thrash guy. I was going to be the technical thrash metal. That was going to be my thing. But it turns out I'm not as hugely into technical thrash metal as I am into black or death metal. But I tried to get into it a lot, and so there's a fair amount of technical thrash metal on this list. Dark Angel later becomes, like, technical progressive thrash metal. Um, but uh, there's, like, at least four others on here that are in the technical thrash sort of category. Um, but anyway, we already did one of mine, so let, let's go to one of yours. And, yeah, I'll let you pick. Um, well, we, we mentioned Tigers of Pantang, right? So let's talk about them. Yeah, let's talk about so, Tigers. So Tigers of Pantang, don't let their silly name fool you. They're actually pretty good. Um, I recommended their, their you know, pseudo magnum opus, which would be Spellbound from 81. Um, you know, you just know by listening to it that Lars Ulrich owned a copy of this album. James Hetfield has the Tigers of Pantang tiger on his battle vest. You know, readily visible. You know, it, it's not the kind of album that you're going to sit down and listen to and be like, okay, I love this. You'd be like, okay, this is probably one of the heaviest things around at the time. I see the influence really easily. You know, I know why these bands liked this band. So that's, to me, what Tigers of Pantang is. I actually think some of the later work is better. So, it is, so uh, Spellbound was listenable to me. But it just didn't, you know, strongly grab me in any particular way. 
Well, again, I think their later work is actually better. Well, then why not include it? Is it later, like, after the 80s? It's, like, two years ago, oh. I think. <laughs> it's, like, recent, recent. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> got, They've got this track, Only the Brave, that I really, <laughs> really dig. And I think it came out... Like, I remember... It came out when I was delivering a Pizza Hut, and I'm like, oh, Tigers of Pantang is still relevant? Cool, let's listen to it. Whoa, this, this is good. But it's Iron like Metal Maiden, Church. But Iron Maiden stole the main riff of uh, Two Minutes to Midnight from Spellbound. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 I think they did. <laughs> so that's that's cool. Um, but anyway, I guess if that's all we had to say. Uh, I yeah, I, I don't have too much to say about Tigers of Pantang apart from that. Yes, so I'm going to move on to the only album I recommended on this list from the first half of the 80s, because uh, the second and a half of the 80s was just more interesting for me, a guy who is focused on thrash metal and how it went into prog, black, and death metal. But you know what is uh, one of the most important albums in the development of black and death metal? It, well, not really an album, but Satanic Rites, the demo by Hellhammer. Um, yeah. Celtic Frost is well known. Probably like half to a third of people that know Celtic Frost know Hellhammer. Hellhammer is the proto. Well, it's because Hellhammer was a laughing stock. Yeah. Everyone made fun of them. They thought they sucked. But they're really good. <laughs> Hellhammer is a really good. Uh, I mean, it's it's sort of like this. It's it's the prototype of Celtic Frost in some ways, but it's just so stupidly raw. It's it's. Uh, Really, the production is, is hard to listen to. Yeah, unless you're the kind of person who listens to Iljarn and Dark Throne and Vaughn and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can tolerate that type of production as well. It's certainly an acquired taste, though. Yes, and the music's kind of an acquired taste too, because it's just very primitive. But it's interesting to see in 1983. It's like Sarcophago. It's interesting to see though in like 1983 them just straining the limits of what was acceptable in music and just stripping everything down to its basics and essentially creating extreme metal. Really? Yeah, they're, they're certainly pioneers. Um, and Messiah is brilliant uh, musically because the entire song is pretty much just... And the... the, the chorus which is just the most primitive version of extreme metal you could get but then there's this one riff in it which turns around the to which is actually negative harmony of that original tone so as far as like doing a lot with a little Hellhammer is there, man. Hellhammer is effective minimalism. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I remember the CP really well. I stumbled. I, I was weird with Hellhammer. I remember when I first met you and we were talking about black metal the first time. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is band Hellhammer. I'm like, oh, dude, I love Hellhammer. And you were just like, you like Hellhammer? Why? <laughs> I, I, that's, that sticks with me for so long. You just. <laughs> that I knew who Hellhammer was. You knew I knew who Celtic Frost was, and you were like, yes. okay, yeah, you definitely like Celtic Frost. But then you're like, why do you like Hellhammer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Hellhammer is Hellhammer is uh, very punk, too. Hellhammer is... That it is, which is not necessarily my thing. Hellhammer... I like, I like hardcore, I don't like punk. Hellhammer is the imagery and production of Venom, and... The occasional slowness and heaviness, and some of the tonality of Black Sabbath, and the rest is just discharge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's more discharge than anything else. Um, which I love discharge. That that does that's that's from the '80s. It's not metal, but it, it counts as a as a gem from the '80s. Maybe not exactly hidden. And from someone who doesn't like punk, discharge is probably my second favorite punk act. Yeah, you, don't 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 underrate discharge. Don't sleep on discharge. Um, yeah, they're, they're worthwhile. Anyways, um, we'll return to you. I'm not sure if we have the same amount of albums on here, so maybe we'll... I don't think we do. 
Okay, but that's okay. We'll we'll return to you for for as long as we can anyway. <laughs> okay, so let's have the the real conversation here. Let's talk about Manila Road. Oh yeah, this is this is the real talk. So this this is going to be the debate here because we both think Manila Road is a really worthwhile band to talk about. They're absolutely a hidden gem. You're going to look at their name and you think, well, what are they like, Tangerine Dream or something like that, or some or like some stupid '70s pop band? No, <laughs> uh-huh. they're like. So here's the general idea of Manila Road. If they had a good singer, they would have been legends. They would have been mercenal if, tier. They would have been like the yeah. just under. Just under Judas Priest, just under Iron Maiden quality of heavy metal stuff. But um, their singer sings like this. He's a total dork. <laughs> He's like it's like Squidward singing in a in a, a new album. Pack, except for places. And now, also, except terrible. suddenly, except uh, apparently, he can do a really good like tough guy voice. Like just uh, out of nowhere, the first time I heard it when I was listening to to the first Manila Road album. Uh, Crystal Logic, like ninety percent of the time he was singing in this super nerdy voice, but then occasionally he just like bursts out into this heavy grunting voice, which is really which is why I and it comes prefer out of Open the Gate. He, yeah. he sings like that more on Open the Gate than uh, Open the Gate than he does on Crystal Logic. Yeah. Crystal Logic, the songwriting is better, but Open the Gate is so much more of a tolerable album because the singer doesn't sing like an idiot. His yes. vocals have just improved marginally, I understand or rather that. significantly. However, like you said, the songwriting is better on Crystal Logic. And secondly, yeah, but performance matters. Performance if you're if you're just looking, matter. if we're looking at an album, from an album performance matters. Okay. And r- seriously, the performance is a huge step forward for them. But they're also trying to hide his vocals on on Open the Gates. And that makes it suffer. Because the weird thing about Manila Road is, even though the singing is not great overall, the vocal melodies are really great. And so if you you can't hear the vocal melodies, you're missing a huge aspect of the music. I I think you're going a little too far there. Because the the, the vocal melody is definitely audible. Like it's not like they hit it in the mix. His voice is there; you can hear it. But but I don't. It's not feel like it's it. hidden. You know, I don't feel its presence. It's not in the forefront. I don't want to sing sing along with it like I do with Necropolis. Even though the vocals are stupid, the chorus is just <laughs> epic. Lost in Necropolis. Lost in Necropolis. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's a good chorus. It's so ridiculous that that <laughs> it's it's just so ridiculous when you think about it. Like <laughs> everything is so great. The melodies are so badass. The guitar is It's absolutely the most <laughs> it just I don't know. It's so cool. You know, it's so cool and well executed, and then the vocals come in and make them look like absolute dorks. <laughs> the lyrics are pretty yeah, it's pretty too. much Manila Road in a nutshell. The lyrics are pretty dorky too, but you know what? I can live with these vocals because somehow it's appropriate. They're dorks. You know, he's a dork singing his dorky vocals, but he transcends his dorkiness through the power of metal and how awesome <laughs> just well-written heavy metal is. Yeah, I think that's a gr- that's a great way to uh, assess Manila Road. <laughs> you you got Really if, if they just called themselves Crystal Logic instead of Manila Road. Like, come on. They, they actually the have a line. Manila, They've actually got a line where they say we shall Fight evil with logic. <laughs> that's that's an extremely dorky line. They did say that. It's it's. Yeah, I'm, I'm, ben, I'm Ben Shapiro. I'm gonna sing in this band <laughs> Manila Road. And I'm gonna fight him with facts and logic. <laughs> no, hold on, that's that's what Manila Road is. Yes, Manila Road is Ben Shapiro's yeah. logic singing. Singing <laughs> heavy metal music from the '80s. Ben Shapiro secretly traveled back in time. <laughs> 80s. 
<laughs> and performed in Manila Road. And, you know, he's kind of dorky, too. Now, I, I'm not trying to diss Ben Shapiro at all. You know, but I, I own a Ben Shapiro shirt. But his voice is a little silly. Yes. And <laughs> Rap isn't music. Let me show you real music. Plays heavy metal music, <laughs> heavy metal song. Um, uh, but Manila Road, I mean, I could just think of it as um, this is a D and D. This is a D and D group that decided to form a band. <laughs> hey, that's what my band is. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That's why you need to cover Manila Road. Mind Razor should cover might, Necropolis. Mind Razor should cover cover Necropolis. I would be so down to hear that. The only cover of Necropolis I have heard is one by like a band called Visigoth, and I just don't think they pulled it off very well. Dude, I know Visigoth. Visigoth is great. I they know. write music about Magic the Gathering. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's very appropriate. <laughs> I was last night. They have a song about that they sing about the Brothers' War and Dominaria, which, if you don't know what that is, it's from the card game Magic the Gathering, made by the same people who made Dungeons and Dragons. It is the first trading card game, and by far the dorkiest. But, yeah, I mean, you, you guys are dorks. You should cover Necropolis. Right now we're working on Into Crypt and Grays. Ooh. Ooh. I, I need to say. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Hey! <laughs> I said well, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Can we wait? Can we take a minute to acknowledge the fact that the chorus of Usupper is just, hey, I said, hey. <laughs> That's the chorus. He just goes, hey, I said, hey. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, um, let's continue. Um, All right, you pick a band. All right. Well, I'd like to talk about. Maybe something that is not quite as dorky and a bit more silly. Um, there's this band called Dead Horse. They're from Texas. They're a crossover thrash band. And their first album has a hell of a title. Horse Core, an unrelated story that's time confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I saw that. And I was when you put that on the list and I saw it, I'm like, all right, this is going to be fun. Did you listen to uh, any of it? I did. I listened to about two tracks, and I don't remember it at all, oh, okay. to be honest with you. Well, then you didn't, I, get, far I do not you, you didn't get far enough into uh, Hank. <laughs> that's, that's, that's when the album starts to get funny. Um, but Horse Core, an unrelated story by, that's time-consuming by Dead Horse. It's like on one of the harder, heavier side, like aspect of crossover thrash, but with a great sense of humor, which I think is an important marker of a crossover thrash band to me. Um, and thrash, looking at you. Yes, but uh, Dead Horse, they just go really fast most of the time. Um, the vocals are really high quality. I think um, very gruff. And they've got some really funny, memorable moments like um, World War whatever. <laughs> and also Hank. Just this moment, like, after three or four uh, almost death crossover thrash metal songs, um, it just opens up with, like, very country sort of twangy guitars. Yeah! You have a horse in the name. You're going to have to have something like that, right? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so Dead Horse. This band also covers Rock Lobster. <laughs> and that's pretty fun. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> Hold on. I love that song. <laughs> ironically like rock lobster and i have tried covering that myself um yeah but dead horse if you like funny heavy short adhd crossover thrash uh with pretty cool vocals i think it's it's very um uh, type vocals um dead horse is a solid pick um yeah, that's, that's dude. What I say about hold, it. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Idea, ready for this? 
black metal cover of Rock Lobster. I'm gonna pass. Rock Lobster! If I'm gonna make a uh, black metal cover of a pop song, it's gonna be uh, turned down for what? I mean, burned down for what? Am I right? <laughs> Get it? Get it? That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Rock Monster is so much better. Yeah, it's a better song, but it, there's no pun. Dude, I am 100% doing cover of Rock Lobster as a bonus track on my black metal album. Okay, fine. You do that. That's that's you. Anyway. We were at the beach. Everybody had magic towels. <laughs> All right. Anyway, now it's your pick. Okay, so let's talk about sortilege. Yes. Metamorphose. So I found sort. Here's my story for finding sortilege. So I was in French class, and I wanted to do a project on French metal. And then I realized there was only one worthwhile French metal band, Gojira. I'm like, this can't be right. There has to be at least one who writes in French. Supper oh oh that writes in French. Um yeah. So Gojira had La Enfant Sauvage, which isn't in French, but the title's in French, and he death growls most of the time. So my thought was the professor wouldn't understand what he's saying, and I could hand her a lyric sheet that was translated in French. But then I actually needed to do something with real French lyrics. So I looked and scoured the internet and somehow stumbled across Sortilege. And their, their first EP, Sortilege, by Sortilege, is kind of mediocre. It's got one really good track on it, Amazon, which means Amazon. But their first album, Metamorphose, is like top tier. The only issue with it is sometimes they come off as like a French pop rock band because of the production, because that's where they obviously recorded it in a pop rock studio. So like, it's just the, the production style kind of shoves them in that way. That's like, they have a very weird way of doing vocals yes, in Fran vocal French production. pop rock. The vocal production, well, to me, honestly, it sounded like kind of just the exaggerated element of like 80s metal. Like the, the production of it, the vocals felt so 80s singing that it started to grate on me after a while. And overall, the music was quite good, so um, I, I liked it overall. But I, I got I got sick of that, you know. I got sick of yeah. I think that's a common trend of a lot of these albums. You know, these albums had a lot going for them, but there was something about them that kind of prevented them from going further. The only the, the only band I can think of that really doesn't have that is um, the the. The bands on the the border case, but yeah, Sortilege is a real hidden gem. Yeah, that's that's pretty much true. The the border case, the borderline cases have nothing going against them. Dead Horse doesn't have anything going against it, but Crossover Thrash is it's just a style. Well, Crossover Thrash is a style that inherently does not have that many followers. Yeah. Although I, I feel like I don't know. I get more out of the weird, obscure crossover thrash bands than I do out of the ma mainstream, the more mainstream ones anyway. Like, Suicidal Tendencies is not as good as Ludacris, for instance. Um, um, but I don't, I don't want to leave Sword of Ledge and talk about Ludacris just yet, because the thing about Sword of Ledge yeah. that I noticed is they felt extremely power metal to me. Yeah, there's definitely like kind of a proto-power metal band. I, I think they feel very much like Dio. Yeah, you know, they're, they're I, I, I feel like Sword Ledge could have been Dio. They're heavier though, and that that's what takes they them are. to the level that's more power metal about it. And I was surprised, honestly, that they were as heavy as they are in 1984, while not trying to be like the heaviest band. They're not a thrash band, but they seem thrash influenced. They seem like thrash influenced heavy metal in 1984, which is not a thing I knew existed. Yeah, and and. Also, um, I, I, I do want to preface this. They're not a power metal band, um, but they, they do have some of the more melodic tendencies of the proto-power metal bands. Like, again, I, I feel like if I had to think of a, an album that most accurately represented what Sortilege is, it would be like Defenders of the Faith, just with a little bit worse production, and it's in French. Yes, and also they do a weird thing with the, like, 
they're just weirdly offbeat on uh, uh, some of their verses, which is good. It keeps me interested. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely intentional too. Yeah, and it's it's not quite to the point where you could call it prog or technical or anything, but like there's just ever so slightly a moment where it's like, wait a second, this is not where it was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's cool. But I, I think if uh, these are probably they're probably like the most hidden band from my side of the list, and yeah. I, I think they're probably the one I would recommend the high most highly. Interesting. Because again, they're just so unique. Interesting. I had others on there that I personally preferred. But anyway, um, I I go now. Yeah, go for it. Uh, all right. So I'm gonna give you guys a borderline case now, because I have done not so borderline case before this. Um, this is probably the most borderline case. But when he put uh, Witchfinder General and Pagan Altar on his list, I said, "Come on, that's just as popular as like Pestilence." And he said, "So put Pestilence on." So I did put Pestilence on. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I do think they belong here, though. Really, I do because I, I can't think of a single person that knows who Pestilence, Witchfinder General, or Pagan Altar is. Okay, but to apart me, from Pestilence us. is like one of the essential death metal bands. Like they built the Lowlands death metal scene. But then again, I guess who knows the Lowlands death metal scenes? They just know Pestilence at least, though. And Asphyx, people know Asphyx, right? Maybe the maybe the more hardcore death metal fans, but I, I was kind of hoping to aim this at people who are not necessarily really deep embedded in the in the metal elitist scene. I was I was hoping we could aim this at people who are more metal novices who are looking to find something a little more obscure. Okay. Which is why I included all the bands I did. You know, I, I think you wanted to look at this as everyone is you and me. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who's watching this is obviously just people like you and me. Yes, exactly. But like I was aiming this more at people like uh, you know again the metal novices or people who listen to you know some obscure like like my my my, my friend Brian or my drummer in Mindraiser he he knows a lot of very deep and obscure bands but maybe th these are some albums he might not have heard of. Okay. You know. Well, in any case, Pestilence is great, dude. Pestilence started out as like a thrash death metal band which is why they're so early they're they're one of the the um prototypical sort of pioneering bands um from the netherlands um eventually yeah. they evolved into like death jazz um very much influenced by atheist and cynic but um that was the period of them i liked more to be honest uh i used to um but then i i really got more into consuming impulse by Pestilence, and it's just a really solid... What's shocking about it, I think, is that the production is uh, so much better than what you would expect from a lesser known death thrash metal band at this time. It's very clear, and the riffing is just precise and aggressive all the way through. Lots of interesting riffs, um, well-connected and good songs. The vocals are nice and intense, and it's just, it's just brutal. It's just brutal and aggressive, thrashy death metal um consuming impulse is a classic it's really kind of essential death metal listening i think if you're trying to understand old school death metal as a whole and uh yeah it's it's just classic yeah I, I, it's a good album i enjoyed it again i i prefer their later work that's more um Maybe. More proggy. Yo, I, I'm a death metal fan, but I've found with death metal, I'm really weird in which bands I like and which albums by which bands I like. Like, The closer a band is to Cannibal Corpse, the less I am to actually enjoy them. But the more they sprinkle in unique things, the more I am likely to really enjoy death metal. And I've really found I, I enjoy bands like Cynic and Atheist who do the weird things. Cause I, and, and even later death where they're doing kind of odd jazzy things in there. It's just, it, it's a little more refreshing to me than potato, potato, you know? Yeah. That's how I started. And then I realized that like a lot of the, there's so many different ways to do even straightforward death metal that like 
once you once you're more and more you get more and more acclimated to the language of it and you realize that there's just so much diversity even in the bands that don't seem as diverse on the surface but well, no i i completely understand uh, again i i just it, it's not what i'm looking for in metal most of the time and when i do li- want to listen to that kind of death metal you know there are, there's a handful of bands that i really really like you know morbid angel being a great example or um, y'all you know, like Cryptopsy? Yeah, yeah. Morbid Angel, Cryptopsy. Those those are actually the bands that I started listening to when I started getting more into the potato side. You know, you start with, you know, so so my progression with death metal. It started out with Atheist, and then a bunch of like technical bands like Cynic, uh, Demi Lich, later Pestilence, um, Death. Demi Lich is cool. All that uh, Gorguts, later Gorguts, all that kind of stuff, and then. It was Swedish bands after that that I got introduced to. I, I like Swedish movies. death better than better than Florida death. Yeah, which I, you know, I, me being an American patriot, that makes me sad that I like Swedish death better. But if I were listening, if I had to pick a potato death metal band, and it wasn't Morbid Angel, I'd probably pick Entombed. Yeah, yeah. As Swedish death is well, Swedish death is it was the next step for me too into getting into more like, HM2. straightforward death metal, more more traditional death metal because it's got that twist. It's uh, more punky. It's more heavy metal too, um, and it's usually got little elements of melody thrown in there. It's just catchier a lot of the time, and it's got a really cool atmosphere to it. Um, so S- Swedish Death is is like the next step, and then I started getting into Morbid Angel and Cryptopsy, and those were the next step. Those are the gateways into like more traditional kinds of death metal. And then after that, it goes into like Autopsy, and then Stuff like Pestilence, actually, and then Sinister, all that kind of stuff got me more and more deep into death metal to the point where I can just say, okay, I'm into, like, all kinds of death metal as long as it's well executed. But Cannibal Corpse does not Yeah, no. <laughs> Cannibal Corpse is bad. <laughs> I like lots of death metal, too. You know, again, I'm not trying to diss death metal. It's just not one of my favorite genres, and I, I tend to prefer my death metal mixed with something else. I just find that more interesting. Like I, I I get why the regular death metal is good and I I like a lot of that stuff, but to me it feels a very a, a lot of death metal bands feel like they're by the numbers. I know a lot of fans of this type of music felt felt this way, especially towards the end of the Florida death metal phase, where like if, if you look at that era in time, you know any anything that sounded remotely close to Cannibal Corpse or Morbid Angel is getting signed like crazy by like you know, Roadrunner and, and those record labels. There's a million and one albums that sound the same, that have the same kind of artwork, the same kind of vocals that you can barely comprehend, you know? So, but, like, I, I think at some point it becomes, you know, it's a movement of tribute bands. Yeah, you it know? could be. There's, there's a lot there's, of bands later there's a bunch on. Of good, there's a bunch of good bands that do that type of thing. And frankly, they have enough material that I don't really feel the need to listen to subpar things to diversify my array of bands. I'd rather just continue listening to Morbid Angel and Entombed, and then go out and find something a little more unique. All right, that's cool. But Pestilence does not fall into that category. Pestilence is... Uh... No, this is a tangent. <laughs> yes. This is a tangent. Yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, what was I going to say here? It's definitely true that a lot of bands became derivative like straightforward death metal um oh yeah um probably especially in florida but there's a lot of stuff that is not derivative it's just not classifiable into any weird uh mixture of death metal with anything else it's definitely death metal and just death metal but it's just weird in some way or another it's just not the way people normally approach it because there's so many different ways to approach death metal there's there's so few like conventions of death metal outside of blasting and um and death growls the main rule in writing your death metal melodies is to not follow the rules you know it's to do something that's outside of the scales (laughs) um but it's funny the way you feel about death metal is a lot of the time the way i feel about jazz i like i like uh, jazz mixed with things more than i like like straightforward jazz most of the time so. I don't think anyone really listens to jazz to enjoy jazz. They like it because they like the art, you know? I listen to Wayne Shorter to just enjoy jazz. 
and I listen to uh, Mingus I um to enjoy jazz. Um, and and I, 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 I listen to Screaming Jay Hawkins, but you know. Yeah, and I listen to things mixed with jazz though more of the time. Death metal mixed with jazz, perfect combination. Death metal. That's a great with, combination. Death right. metal working. Yeah, death death jazz is always. I mean, you can do bad death jazz. I've heard it done, but but death jazz in general is is a great little micro genre. Anyways, let's continue. Um, it's your turn. We've been talking about pestilence and death metal for a while. All right, so I'm gonna add one that is um, uh, we didn't have on the list. That I just remembered. Oh. So I just remembered this band is from the '80s. So this is one of my favorite little n- nonsense albums from the '80s, and it is "In Re" by Sarcophago. I thought you Sarcophago. Hated Sarcophago. <laughs> Sarcophago is perhaps the funniest band to ever walk the earth. They're funny, but I thought you they, hated Sarcophago. I love Sarcophago. <laughs> Sarcophago is to metal what The Room is to cinema. <laughs> it's so bad, it's good. The music is terrible. So bad, you just want to laugh at it. And you know what's even better? They cannot speak English. But damn, do they try. Hey, Nick. If you are false, don't don't entry. entry Because you'll be burned and died. This is is a lyric from a sarcophago track (laughs) called Death Rash. This is, this is, this is, well, well, for Elitist, this is a classic, like, uh, call. This is this is this is how you gatekeep as an elitist. You say if you're a false adult entry because you'll be burned and died. So if someone says what, they're not a real elitist. If you say <laughs> yep. sarcophago, <laughs> then that's what I know. Yes, yeah, so just for this your, is how your elitists record. recognize each other. The one elitist says if you're a false, don't entry, and the other elitist says because you'll be burned and died. <laughs> Here's a, a list of song titles from Sar- from this album. I think you'll enjoy them. Track one, Satanic Lust, Desecration of Virgin, Nightmare, Inri, Christ's Death, Satanus, Ready to Fuck. <laughs> oh, Ready to Fuck. Death Rash, and The Last Slaughter. Re released bonus tracks Re Crucify, The Black Vomit. The Black Vomit Lie. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Come <laughs> on. Those names are so stupid. But you know, it's, it's funny. because They're probably the only band doing this kind of nonsense in night- when Inri came out. And despite how terrible they were, they probably influenced somebody. They probably influence everybody. <laughs> they, they, they're one of the most important bands in the history of black metal, especially, and also death metal, a significant amount. Um, like Hellhammer, their riffs are kind of just stupid extreme. You know, it's just. You know, just play up and down the guitar. That's it. Just, just, just hit the next fret up and then hit the next fret down, and that's it. And just strum as fast as you possibly can. That's that's how you do metal. Yeah, that that, that so Sarcophago is. You know when and ever anyone says metal is just metal, metal is just metal. screaming and noise. <laughs> just yes, that's that's what sarcophago is. It's just sarcophago. screaming yeah. and noise. It's just random <laughs> screaming and noise about Satan, and they're just randomly playing whatever on the guitar as fast as they can, hitting the drums as fast as they can. The screaming isn't even trained. It's just random. It's just a random guy screaming. It's exactly like <laughs> what people who hate metal think metal is. Is exactly what sarcophago is. <laughs> uh, it also helps to kind of look like idiots. <laughs> like, it, just, just Google this band, and uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised at what you see. It's kind of like proto Abath, uh. except except from uh, you know Brazil. Yeah, 
to me, they're a borderline case because obviously every elitist knows it, but um, that's, that's how you know someone's an elitist. But if you're not an elitist, you probably don't know Sarcophago, I guess. So. so I guess this is how we've achieved our elitist cred. We know who Sarcophago is. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, um, what is there anything here that can uh, destroy my elitist cred instantly? No, but I'll give it my best shot with forbidden, uh, forbidden's forbidden evil, which is kind of just a thrash album. <laughs> like it's not particular. It's it's basically like another Testament album, but the production is better than anything Testament had in the '80s because Testament did not have good production in the '80s. I'm sorry. Yeah, but they had Chuck Billy, so it's okay. Yeah, that's true. But forbidden is very much just kind of Testament. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they kind of are a second testament. And I, I didn't give this album too deep of a listen, but it's definitely the type of album I definitely would like. So, But you if know. you want to listen to more testament from the 80s with production where you can actually hear what they're singing and saying, um, then go ahead and listen to Forbidden Evil by Forbidden. Also, Rob Flynn of Violence and then Machine Head uh, wrote a couple of these songs partly because he was in forbidden before he joined violence which is how i found them incidentally but um i i dislike rob flynn greatly yeah but his music's pretty good yeah but he's a piece of crap he's definitely I, I, not I'm the team smartest phil demo all the way. He's, he's, i'm team phil demo all the way uh rob flynn is definitely not the smartest fellow um that's for sure um, and his new <laughs> new albums are uh, filled with some pretty douchey lyrics. <laughs> Catharsis places. might have been the worst thing to come out of metal of the decade. Catharsis, the song, is not bad. I was actually hyped for the album when I heard the single, because Catharsis, the song, was pretty good. And then every the, other song on this album is bad. There was the song Bastards, right? That's what it's called? That terrible one? Well, that's one of the terrible ones, <laughs> but Triple that's, Beam that's is also one of, I heard off of that album. But Triple Beam is also one of the terrible ones, and so is Beyond the Pale. So there's a bunch of terrible ones, but Bastards is the Four yeah. Chords one that is terrible. Yeah, when I heard Bastards the first time, I thought, okay, I'm never going to buy another Machine Head album, and I'm completely okay with that. Oh, so man. yeah. Anyway, yeah, a rest in peace, Machine Head. You were my favorite band in high school. Um, you were never my favorite band. <laughs> Burn My Eyes is a good album, though. The the later Gothenburg type stuff. I mean, it's not Gothenburg, but the later new, the, the more melodic later stuff is also good. Yeah, it's decent. Yeah. Anyways, um, that is not talking about Forbidden, but there's not that much to say about Forbidden. It really is just testament to. <laughs> without chuck billy yeah but the vocalist sounds a lot like chuck billy and he's very good you know so yeah they, they, it's, they, it's hard to be chuck billy though he's not chuck billy but he's the next best thing yeah um but anyway i guess i'm gonna, John ball, I'm gonna toss the ball back to you all right so let's talk about some doom metal oh yeah so I want to talk about Pagan Altar. So Pagan Altar is a band I inexplicably found two years before I went to college. And they are just like raw Black Sabbath. It's like proto-black metal meets Black Sabbath with this really weird vocalist. And I just love every moment of it. Their riffs are very swingy and bluesy, so like bam, nan, and lan, nan, ba, na, na. Yeah, that kind of kind of riff, kind of Zeppelin feeling. It's very old feeling, and everything about them just feels really old, yeah. and it just it resonates with you. You know, they've got a lot of great music. You know, um, Judgment of the Dead is definitely my favorite track by them. I know it's the title track, but you know, it, I, I like title tracks a lot of the time. There's something about them. Pagan Altar is from the '80s, which makes them pretty old, but they feel like they're from the '60s. <laughs> they really do. They feel, they feel a lot older than they are. Uh, again, I, I feel like 
pagan altar could if they had come out with Black Sabbath, they would have been huge. Maybe. They would um, have been black the second Black Sabbath. I mean the other the other thing about Pagan Altar, they, they feel like they feel like an album Pentagram feels this way too. It feels like an album you would find in some creepy abandoned house. It's like just this vinyl, this old vinyl that you found randomly in the attic yeah. of some creepy guy's house. Some some creepy dead guy's house. It's all abandoned and you open it up and it's just like this weird occult feeling thing that's so dusty and decrepit. Um, the vocals are also kind of like not good. Like Manila Hold on, I actually hard disagree. But they work. They're for it. weird. Yeah. They're weird, but they're really good. I, okay, I don't think they're good, but I think they work. I don't know. I, I just I, I've always loved his voice. It's very. Nasal. It's exactly what I wanted from them. Uh, it, it is very nasal. Yeah, it, it's very nasal. Uh, Oh, it's like, like kind of like Leonard Skinner type of vocals. I mean, it was which again, yeah, it gets a seventies vibe. They feel so American. It fits for them. How are they English? They feel so American. They really do feel like an American. <laughs> British. <laughs> yeah, like they feel like they're from Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they they do songs that are kind of like themed around Doctor Who, so that kind of takes it out of them. Like one of their albums is called The Time Lord. That's mm-hmm. obviously about Doctor Who. I guess so. But Ghost is trying to be Pagan Altar, um, but not Raw. Tried. Tried to be Pagan Altar. They stopped trying to be Pagan Altar. Yeah, that's Alter. true. They tried to be Pagan Altar on their first album. Um, and then they tried to have the production of Pagan Altar on their latest single. <laughs> you know, it, it, it is kind of like if, um, you know... It, if Ghost was what people wanted Ghost to be, it would be Pagan Altar. Yeah. Um, it, no, here we go. <laughs> Pagan Altar is Ghost for Elitists. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that's a good assessment. They don't do the masks and hokey stuff like that. But, yeah. Just if, if you're into to do metal, they don't even really wear robes anymore. Oh. I've see, seen some recent live videos. They're just normal guys. Oh, okay. So yeah, Pagan Altar. Yeah, I especially like the, the, the keyboards on Judgment of the Dead. Yeah, the keyboards are unique. Um, the riffs are very straightforward, kind of twangy, but they're effective. They're emotional. They feel like you're touching something beyond, you know, it's, it's a cult. It's dusty. It, it's got that very, like, modified SG through a Laney sound like, like Tony Iommi would get. Out of his guitar, maybe I don't know if that's what they're using on that album because there's no information on it. But it really has that that really old feel, yeah. and yeah, again, it brings you back in time. And I think it, it it's very, you know, doomy. I know that's that doesn't mean much, but like when I think of doom metal, this is what I want out of it. I I don't really want that stonery type of doom metal sound. I want this kind of doom metal sound where they, they do the bluesy thing, but somehow it sounds more evil. Like I've always found pagan altar to be way more evil sounding than pentagram. Uh, I'm going to disagree there. I found, I found pagan altar to be um, nice and melodic comparatively. There's something evil about it, but pentagram's just super, super evil to me. Um, but um, I, I don't see it. Okay, well, whatever. But um, Pagan Altar is is definitely a borderline case, though, because when I think of 80s doom metal, they're one of the bands that comes immediately to mind. Immediately what comes into mind is Candlemass, Trouble, Pentagram, and then St. Viatus, and then it's like Witchfinder General and, uh, and um, Pagan Altar. You know, yeah. But how many people out there know who these bands are? How many? Apart from like us, the elitists, Anyone you know. Who's into like, doom I, metal. I yeah, but like people who aren't into doom metal, this is if, if you if you're not deep into doom metal or never were, you're never going to have stumbled across Pagan Altar, and it really is an album worth listening to, even if you're not 
uh, a big doom metal fan. You know, it, 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 I think it's an essential of the new album era, and most fans of raw metal would like it. All right. Well, um, we ready to move on? I want to talk. Okay, about, go for it. Um, something pretty, uh, I, I guess, pretty personal to me, probably just because I found them so early on. So they really struck a chord with me for whatever reason. Immaculate Deception by Ludacrist. This is a random crossover band from, from New York. Um, and Immaculate Deception came out in 86. And I don't know. It's pretty good. It's got a lot of funny moments. They, 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 they rap about green eggs and ham on like a, a crossover thrash album. Um, <laughs> they've got a moment where they go, <laughs> Mommy, where is God? why son god is everywhere and then later in the song hey waiter there's god in my soup <laughs> it's so no, that's uh, i'm going to just and dumb jump in here and funny um i i didn't like this album it, it's just kind of too crossovery for me and it's it's crossovery in the way that i don't like like i i love crossover thrash People have called my band crossover thrash, which definitely isn't. But people have called my band that. You know, I'm a huge Power Trip fan. Exactly who would call your band? How do you get that idea in some, your head? Some guy in, on the on the the radio said, "Oh, crossover thrash band Mind Razor." Crossover thrash. How did he get the? We were we were announced on the radio as a crossover thrash band. I feel like. That would be by somebody who does not know what crossover thrash is. You just thrash. <laughs> Why the hell would you use the term if you didn't know what it was? <laughs> People just like to throw around words because they they sound fancy and whatever. I, I think. I I, th- I my, my theory of, is. I can, yeah. Go on. But my 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 theory was that this person mistook crossover thrash for neo thrash. That's believable. Because we're, we're definitely Neo Thrash, because we're Thrash that came out today. Yeah. But we don't even really fit in the Neo Thrash movement because we sound very different from a lot of the Neo Thrash bands. Yeah, and you're after like the initial wave of Neo Thrash bands. Now you're just... I feel like it's just now Thrash Metal's back and it's just Thrash Metal, you know? Yeah. There were the bands that were part of that Neo Thrash revival, and now if you want to start a Thrash Metal band, it's just... You're a Thrash Metal band. <laughs> <laughs> But um, to, to digress to Ludacrist, but it's just a weird album, man. Yeah, it is. It's weird. It's it's funny, honestly. This is a comedy album <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it felt like if Mr. Bungle were hardcore. A little bit, yes. Um, it doesn't That's have, how I felt about it. It doesn't have nearly as many different elements as Mr. Bungle, but they, they've got a lot of... No, if Mr. Bungle just made hardcore, the whole if it was Mr. Bungle the band and they were exclusively making hardcore, that's what this is. Oh, it's it's pretty funny to there's there's one where the chorus is just most people are dicks, most people are dicks, most people are dicks, most people, most people, most people are dicks. <laughs> I mean, it's accurate. <laughs> yeah, it's accurate. They say at the end of the song, it's so fucking true. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly that is true. That is true about both of us. Um, <laughs> so that's 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 why Luke Christ is. But jeez, you you guys have nothing to do with crossover thrash. You were not punk at all, except for Better Dead is a little bit punk. <laughs> well, that was the song they were playing. So well, fair enough. It just it your vocals on Better Dead sound a lot like DRI. It just it just feels like that kind of style to me. <laughs> We don't sound anything like DRI. <laughs> I don't know. Your not even your vocals so much as like the lyrics. The lyrics combined with your song approach, it just felt very punky. Um, okay, so point point of information for those of you who've never listened to Mindraiser before, the vocal style on Mindraiser is Bruce Dickinson, except he occasionally tries to do black metal rasps. That that's what Mindraiser is. Yeah, and it's it's over like heavier Megadeth. More or less. That's what Mindraiser is. So I don't think that's crossover thrash. Yes, but on Better Dead, the the it's the most straightforward way you can do a Megadeth. So it's very punky in that way, and the lyrics yes, this feel is true. punk because they're just do direct and political. And I don't know. <laughs> um, 
how can you say that? How can you say that the USA would be better that way if it were me? That's I take the bill of friend. rights or my life. Yeah, but well, people think Dave Mustaine's kind of punky sometimes. This is true. Um, anyway, so but but every other Mind Razor song is not punky at all. Entombed in Time is, is a punk song. <laughs> 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 oh, the punks always fall. <laughs> these are these are inside jokes. If you're in the mind raiser camp, yes. Well, anyway, uh, your turn. Uh, let's let's keep the doom train going. Let's talk about Witchfinder General. The other board. So Witchfinder is. General is very similar to Pagan Altar, but they're also very different. They they are like the other side of Black Sabbath. If Pagan Altar is like every song is either symptom of the universe or uh, uh, electric funeral. Witchfinder General, every song is like never say die and the mob rules. And the singer sounds so much like Ozzy. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's just he sounds so much like Ozzy. I remember the one time I was with my dad in the car and he's a huge Black Sabbath fan. Immense Black Sabbath fan. He his grad he, his graduating quote in his in his yearbook he graduated in 1980 it was like i hope black sabbath will still be good with this new guy <laughs> so it was <laughs> spoiler alert it was, it was. Yeah. <laughs> like he had his copies of all of their, their finals and gave them to me you know he's a sabbath guy and we're in the car and i put we, the song was quietest reprise off of uh what that what's this album called called it's called Friends of Hell. And uh, he's just like, what album is this off of? I thought I had all of their stuff. <laughs> like, Who do you think this is? He's like, Sad. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> this is Witchfinder General. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, sounds like, it sounds a lot like Dio era Sabbath, but with Ozzy on vocals. Yeah. Um, that, that's what, that's what Witchfinder General is. And it's just slightly lower, like down pitched, and just slightly more aggressive. So you can hear that it's transforming from like Sabbath into proper doom metal in that way. Um, but overall, it's just yeah, fun kind of kick-ass doom metal. That's it. And they sing about drugs. And and they've and they've got <laughs> uh, they got boobies on their album cover. <laughs> that is true. There are boobies in their album cover. <laughs> and you know what? The track, the, the the first track in the album, "Love on Smack," <laughs> dude, that chorus is so good. She's dying. She's dying. She's dead. Great track. I don't know. I was uh, kind of focused on the riffing. They they do some serious stuff too, though. You know, like again, the, the track "Quietest Reprise" is is probably like in the top five or six doom metal songs not written by Black Sabbath. But. Yeah. You know, it, it really emphasizes what is great about the genre. Yeah. So, uh, these guys are certainly more digestible than Pagan Altar, but you know, they're they're very good. You know, that's all I can say. The, the, both of the albums are are fantastic. Big and the song Cathedral. So, if you like, uh, yeah, I, I think they're better than Cathedral. I prefer Cathedral uh, personally. I like Cathedral, but again, I think they're they're the. Even though I don't think they're necessarily a stoner metal band, they feel more stonery. Even though the this band has a song, "Strip on LSD." You know, they have a song where that is the chorus. Yeah, it's just they somehow feel like less of a stoner metal band for me. Yes, Cathedral is more stoner. They're also more death metal somehow, <laughs> um, but they're just. I don't know. They don't. They don't really sing about weed or anything. I, th- I feel like that's what distinguishes good stoner metal bands from bad stoner metal bands is that bad stoner band metal bands just sing about weed all the time. <laughs> Look, you know, as a person who writes music about politics, you need to do. If, if you're if you're a musician and you're trying to write something, uh, write a song, and you're trying to write lyrics. You gotta do something innovative, you know. If you're an extreme metal band and you're just like, "I'm gonna write a song about Satan," yeah, there's got to be something original about that, or it's gonna come off as boring and derivative. 
that's why Ghost is kind of so revolutionary because they were th these lyrics could have easily been transplanted into any death metal song and it could have been considered okay this is boring and generic but they did it in the context of music that normally wouldn't have that type of lyric and that's why it was really cool at the time and why everyone was going crazy about it you know, they weren't reinventing the wheel but they just did it in a context that was way out there and it had the weird tongue and cheek cheek sex humor in there too so more it was really cleverly written metal. more black than death metal more like Anyway. Yeah, but if you're if you're writing a song about marijuana, you know, don't put it in a doom metal album because okay, that's been done to death. Well, I mean, it's not even. I don't, I don't think anyone needs to hear another song about marijuana. To be honest, every genre has done it way too many times, and maybe that's just because I'm straight no, we edge. Need to, we need to hear a black metal song about marijuana. <laughs> I'm sure it exists. It's terrible, <laughs> but um, I I don't think it's so much like even that the lyrics are. Uh, yes, it's boring if you do a stoner metal song about weed, usually. But it's not even because of the lyrics. It's because it's just the mark of an uncreative band so many times. Like, yeah, I just feel like those bands, like Weed Eater, Bongzilla, they're just, you can tell they're uncreative because they're a stoner metal band and everything they do is, ha ha, yeah. weed, ha ha, Satan smokes weed with me. <laughs> and then yeah. we smoke some more weed. The same blues riff over and over again. <laughs> that, that, that's you know the if you're trying to write a, a lyrics to a song, you need to do something remotely interesting, and and try to avoid writing in the conventional topics of the genre. And if you do write in those conventional topics. You have to do something different. That's why when you know, me being a thrash metal band writing about politics, you know, I I instead of writing wrote writing about taking down the system, I wrote about authoritarianism and I kind of did it in a very punk fashion, which is kind of what I think sets better dead aside from, you know, any generic fuck the system thrash metal song, you know, pseudo anarchist type of thing. And you can never go and, wrong yeah. writing about uh, a book of any kind. Uh, yeah, I mean, my band does that too. Unless it's Harry Potter, you, you, then you can go very. Long. Don't write about that. Don't write about Harry Potter, but write about any other book. Oh. <laughs> More important, you're a power metal band. Under no circumstances should you write about Lord of the Rings. That is incorrect. Hold on, I love Lord of the Rings, and I love power metal. And one of my favorite power metal songs is called Lord of the Rings. It's been done. You don't need another shower metal song about Lord of the Rings. Write about Game of Thrones. Oh, wait. Blind Guardian did that, too. Damn it. <laughs> Write a power metal uh, about... Uh... No, one, no one writes about Clark Ashton Smith. No one writes about Clark Ashton Smith. That's because what... no one but you and me know who that is. And you only know who that is because I told you. <laughs> and I haven't even read any of this stuff. But uh, Mordigian was going to be our doom metal band for a hot second there. You know, I actually ended up utilizing the one riff I wrote for Mordigian in my black metal album. Oh, nice. It's the main riff to Norwegian Troll. Right, right. Anyways, we should continue, I think. Um, okay. What have we got left here? Damn, I've got um, four albums left. We gotta, we gotta hurry. We gotta not get too uh, distracted. All right, all right so... so Let's just um. Uh, I think we should just talk about the the two most important albums left because we're running out of time here. We're almost on an hour and a half. So I, why don't we talk three. about? It's got to be three. I I I I, I want to skip earlier. We gotta talk about Tormentor. We gotta talk about Samson. Yeah, we gotta go talk about Tormentor and Samson. I gotta talk about Toxic and Paradox, and I can skip Coroner. Uh, name drop Coroner. Coroner's pretty cool. They're extremely technical. Um, thrash. Um. But um, something's got to be dropped here because we got to save time. <laughs> okay. Um, but now I guess I will talk about Toxic. Think this, which Nick does not like. And I kind of understand Look, why Nick I, doesn't I, like I tried it. so hard. It, it's definitely some, sounds like the type. If, if you described Toxic to me, it would be the, it'd be like, that sounds exactly like something I would like. It's technical. No, it's terrible. Tracks. It's what it is. It's not good. It's technical anthrax. It's it's pretty good. I like it. Poorly written anthrax. No. <laughs> um, 
toxic, I, I could see how you could get bored of it. I think the funny thing is, I pretended to like toxic the first five or six times I listened to it, and then I wound up actually liking it. <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. I actually got it going in my headphones while we're talking, just to try and give it another chance again, because like I really hope I'm wrong. Listen to Shotgun again, Logic. Shotgun Logic is uh, is good, and it's a, it's basically a straight edge thrash metal song. So bonus points. <laughs> it's about um, how um, how you, you that is the track I'm listening to. By the way, you're listening to Shotgun Logic. Shotgun Logic is good. That is. The uh, in God is good. Shotgun Logic is good. Spontaneous is good. Think this is not that great, actually. Think this is like the worst. The first song is probably the worst song on the album. <laughs> uh, there's there's so many moments where they just like stop what they're doing to play something unrelated. <laughs> like I remember enjoying "There Stood the Fence." I remember enjoying that track. Yeah, that's the ballad. It's really good. Toxic's at their best when they're trying to do like more melodic stuff, to be honest. Which is why In God is so good. That's why Spontaneous is good. Machine Dream is fun because it's got that weird chorus. Um, which is very... It, it's a Mixolydian. It feels really psychedelic. Um, it also feels like they're kind of the prototype for stuff Dream Theater do. To be honest with you. Dude, they sound so much like Dream Theater. Yeah. Well, this is theaters. like think this is very early dream theater. Dream theater. Think this is the bridge between Anthrax and Dream Theater. That's what the, that's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> those two things shouldn't be talked about in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and dream theater and Anthrax. They're, they're pretty antithetical to each other. I'm not that into even either, though. I but for some bad. reason, I like. To, for some reason, I like Toxic, even though I'm not really that into. I'm somewhat into Dream Theater. And I like Dream Theater the has songs. Yeah. Anthrax has one of the best live shows I've ever seen, and Dream Theater just has some really, really good songs and a lot of garbo. Yeah. Toxic's kind of in the same place as Dream Theater, to be honest, in terms of having uh, some good songs and a lot of garbo. Um, but this track has great riffs, but the, the I'm listening to Shotgun Logic. The track has great riffs, and it's got weird Voivody stuff in there. But what's terrible about it is the vocal melody has nothing to do with the song. Yeah, I like, can see this why song is just too complicated for the vocals. That's so, like, I can see where you're going with it. They that. wanted to have melodic vocals. They wanted to have good melodic vocals, like James the Briar or uh, what's his name, uh, Jeff Tate. But their music is too complicated to accommodate that kind of vocals, and the guy doesn't know what to put over, so he just kind of. Ah! Ah! Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. There. That 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 is kind of true. Um, it's either a, they they didn't write songs for the vocalist they had. That's usually true. That is usually true. But you you can kind of get used to it if you think of him as like some guy at the circus, like a circus announcer, which is why their first album I think was called World Circus because it's just like these weird these weird chaotic riffs over like a guy doing like classic '80s Labrie whatever kind of vocals. Um, yeah. It, it sounds like a circus announcer, and if you accept that, then then you can go, you you can appreciate it. And they've got some really strong like melodic moments, too. On top of that, so I I like Toxic. Think this overall, um, but it's it's a hard album to like. It's not easy to like, um, and it is exactly the bridge between Dream Theater and Anthrax, which is a weird sentence to say, but. <laughs> If that sounds interesting to you, then check it out. Um, yeah, your turn. Okay, so uh, no, why don't we talk about uh, Tormentor first? Because okay. I'd I'd like to save Samson for last. Okie doke. Uh, well, I I've got to, I've also got to talk about Paradox by Heresy. We'll talk about Paradox then. Okay, so Heresy by Paradox is another uh, album from the time I was trying to get into technical thrash metal. And you would like it a lot more, honestly. It's, they, they, um, yeah. Honestly, in a lot of ways, it's similar to Toxic, but whereas Toxic is kind of all over the place, scatterbrained, weird, chaotic, um, Paradox doesn't try to be prog. They're technical because it just requires a high level of playing to be able to do what they're doing. Um, 
they've got a little bit of a power metal slint, um, but overall, they're much more on the thrash side. And I think the thing about Paradox is this one time um, I was listening to Heresy by Paradox, which, by the way, is a concept album about the persecution of the Cathars in uh, 13th century France. Yes. Um, by Pope Innocent. <laughs> the, the, the Cathar Heresy, which is interesting. Um, but the thing about it is like, there's been a couple times where I started this album and I just wanted to stop. But then, like, the beginning of the next song would play, and I'm like, oh, that is so heavy. I got to keep going. You know? That's the thing about uh, Paradox by Heresy. Or, no, Heresy by Paradox. I have it backwards. Um, is, is, it, is it Heresy by Paradox? Because there is a band called Heresy. No, it's Heresy by Paradox. Paradox is the band, Heresy is the album. It, Heresy is the album because the Heresy is the Cathar Heresy. That is um, the concept album that this is talking about. Um, and it's... Uh, I, if you like thrash metal, you're probably going to enjoy it. It's as simple as that, honestly. It's, Are they on Spotify? No. That's the issue. So you'd have to check it out on YouTube or download it or whatever. I have... Ah, uh, it's not on Spotify. Not on Spotify. Not on Spotify. It doesn't exist. <laughs> uh but anyways, the, the only thing that transcended that rule for me is Tool. Yeah. Now I'm not an elitist at all. I just lost all my elitist cred for, t for saying I like Tool. Uh, Tool's really good, and <laughs> there's no logic to why Tool's not accepted except that they're popular and not old enough. And that their fan base is annoying. Yeah, their fan base is annoying, but so is uh, Metallica's fan base. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and you can't just reject the first four Metallica albums. Then you're just being contrarian. Um, yeah. But anyway, now I guess since you wanted to leave Samson for last, and we'll we'll mention Wall of Sound by Killer. This album is just kind of okay. It just felt like felt like a. Um, you, it was you, it was big, it was big for the '80s. Okay. Well, anyway, so it's kind of bad. It, it's very standard heavy metal to me, and it was just like not that interesting. But that's okay. We'll keep going. Um, Tormentor, Annie Dominic. So, we can both. Talk I have about a lot to say about this album. Yes. So you can go first, though. I'll let you, I'll let you start. It is Attila's uh, before Mayhem project, basically. It is the the. And he's, he's still in it, actually. Oh, is he? Yeah. yeah, they're still together. But uh, Tormentor is uh, a thrash... It's like a first wave black metal thrash band, but with like a lot of the characteristics of what was going to make black metal, second wave black metal, distinct. It's much darker than you would expect thrash of this period to be. It's got that eerie vibe. It's got lots of atmosphere to it. And it's got Attila on vocals. <laughs> and Attila's got some wild vocals, and he he's just as wild on this as he is in Mayhem. In fact, I think he has a little bit more creative freedom on this record, so he's able to to do his his deal. And I'm pretty sure this was dead for Mayhem's favorite album because that's why he recommended Attila to take his place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I you know, the, the standout track of this album to me is Elizabeth Bathory. There's just that one riff. It's just quintessential for me. And, and you know, dissection covered it, and it's really good. It's it's so it it this this album is thrash metal for Hungarian or for Cathartian vampires. You know, Transylvanian vampires. Yeah, it, it's That's made in, in. it's like made in Transylvania, <laughs> and it's. It's just like eerie thrash, and they write about Bathory, and he's probably actually descended from Bathory, being his name. His name's Attila. That's his real name. <laughs> it's his name. His name is Attila. He's from Hungary, and his name's actually Attila. Attila, Attila Seahart is Attila the Hun. That is an accurate <laughs> statement about this man. And he's the singer of a black metal band and this band. 
and this is uh, I don't know it's ex it's befitting the greatness of Attila to uh, for this this album um, yeah be like what he did before Mayhem um, and it's eerie it's Transylvanian thrash <laughs> it's uh, Dracula headbanging. He, like, he sounds like Dracula when he sings. Like, no, he doesn't like Dracula. He sounds like Nosferatu. Yeah, from yeah. from uh, the the silent film. If you have ever wondered, if, if you don't know what Attila Sihar sounds like, just go watch Nosferatu and think to yourself, what does this guy talk like? Yeah, that's Attila. But yeah, you can't go wrong with any Domini by Tormentor. That's just yeah. Yeah, and let's continue the trend of former bands of legendary singers and this is samson and we'll, we'll, tell, we'll tell you who it is later but samson is a, a very new wabam band it's kind of somewhere between acdc and judas priest yeah it's got they just happen to have an amazing singer yeah it's got like the twang of of hard rock and it's got a lot of like the more mel melodic bluesy side of hard rock rather than a heavy metal side but the rhythm is straight up heavy metal like it's extremely heavy yeah. metal rhythmically, and um, it's also heavy metal vocally, of course. Um, and for being in that hard rock heavy metal like middle place, to me, like if you were to call this just a hard rock album, I would be like, "Wow, I like this a lot more than I normally like hard rock." Because there's just by the way, the album is called Shock Tactics. Yes, there's just more interesting like twists and turns to it. Um, but it feels very, you know, classic, you know, I am a rocker, I work on cars and drink beer and that kind of stuff kind of thing. But there's just lots of, like, little twists in the riffs. And it's a very it's unique that, drummer. It's got that plodding riffs, and it's got that, like, plodding rhythm to it, but with the twang guitar. So it feels refreshing in that sort of way. It's great. It's a great album. I was working when I was listening to it, and it was hot out, so... um it felt appropriate, got my iced tea, got my work, and it's hot. And I'm listening to twangy, hard rock type stuff. I feel working class now. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm a working class dude or something like that. Um, but, um, which I guess technically I am. But in any case, yeah, elephant in the room time, I think. Oh, yeah. Bruce Dickinson sings on it. <laughs> yeah, this is Bruce Dickinson's best of all time. Yes. And he he makes it work, you know? You think you'd need he really to, nailed it. Yeah, you'd think you'd need something maybe less Bruce Dickinson for it, but Bruce Dickinson uh, definitely fits the bill for Samson somehow. Um, I can see why he left, because it's a very different style Iron from Maiden. Maiden. Yeah, well, it's a very different style from Iron Maiden. Like, what he said is, Iron Maiden, these guys are artists. And Samson is not exactly that kind of music. It's much more of a rocker vibe than Iron Maiden's much more intellectual approach to things. Um, but it's got weird twists in it, and it's very effective at its straightforward, at its more straightforward style. And Bruce Dickinson does a hell of a job in it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think anyone who can appreciate metal vocals can understand bruce dickinson's the greatest vocalist in our genre yeah. you know just being able to enjoy more work of his is reward yeah. appreciate everyone knows what iron maiden was doing before bruce came in but like this is what bruce was doing before he joined iron maiden and kind of his developmental years before singing on number of the beast which you know obviously is the most bruce possible song also, it's basically what uh, Iron Maiden started trying to become Samson again in, like, the early 90s, and they did it very badly. <laughs> like, imagine if Fear to Eternity, or Here to Eternity, were good. That's what Samson is. Yeah, From Here to Eternity is very similar to Samson. <laughs> Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter is very, very similar, similar to, to Samson. Samson. Yes, only Samson However, do it I, I actually... Well, I, I really like Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, actually. I think that's a great track. I think it's an underrated track. Though I am an Iron Maiden diehard fan. I've listened to every Iron Maiden song. Even Black Bart Blues. By the yeah. way, that's a hidden gem of the 80s. Please listen to Black Bart Blues by Iron Maiden. It's on the Can I Play With Madness single. 
Well, you know, what would have made Bring Your da Daughter to the Slaughter better, though? If Samson what? was playing it. Well, the, the, the track originally was for Bruce Dickinson's solo band, and he recorded it for the A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 soundtrack. But um, Iron Maiden needed a single, so they're like, ah, we're going to make this our single. Yeah. But, yeah, that's actually the best description. It's, it's like a twangy that's, that's version. It's a twangy version of that weird phase Iron Maiden was going through that no one understood where they were coming from. But if you understood Samson, then you'd be like, oh, that's why they're doing it. He's trying to go, go back to his uh, youth. Youthful days Except for some reason, Bruce didn't do much of the writing in that era. <laughs> well, anyways, um, I guess that about wraps it up. So yeah, we talked about some soda. We talked about some good '80s metal. Bruce Dickinson and Attila Sihar's roots. Yes. Um, and also Electric uh, Doom. We we also talked about um, um, Tom G. Warrior's roots. Don't forget that. That's right. And Rob Flynn's roots. Well, hold on, they were just. Yeah. It's Rob Flynn's. Roots I didn't know Rob Flynn was that old. Rob Flynn is pretty old. I mean, Rob Flynn. He was in Violence, so he's like just like. A couple of years younger than Metallica, basically. He's probably in his late forties, I guess. Um, but yeah, violence is better than Machine Head. Uh, no, no, I'm gonna go with no. I'm gonna go with yes. Well, I'm gonna go with no. Poop frog. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> what the All right, we're going to end it there. We're going to end it there. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Oh, how would you rank orange soda? Orange soda? <laughs> yes. Well, that's tough. So, I, I like orange soda. Um, are we talking about ranking the different types of it? Or are we talking about putting it on the tier? No, putting it overall on the tier. Although it's clear that the worst is like Sunkissed, and the best is like Fanta, or like craft ones. Fanta's better than Sunkissed. Okay, so you can agree with this, yes? Yeah, Orange Crush is pretty good too. I don't think I've had Orange Crush. You know what's better That's than what the sold orange soda? The creamsicle soda. The orange creamsicle soda. I don't know if I've ever had that. But yeah, I, I would put orange soda at like A tier. Yeah, pretty much. I guess it's up there. Yeah, orange soda's pretty good. I'm going to be honest. I, th I think most orange soda tastes the same. Like I don't have a, a problem between any of the brands. Either Crush, Fanta, or Sunkissed. I like them all. Do you have a preference as far as root beer, as far as the main bands? Because I do. Yeah, I do too, actually. Uh, I, I would prefer anything that comes in the glass bottle first. Right, but then second of, like, the, the non-glass bottle type of, like, the normal. Yeah, of the normal, I think IBC is pretty good. i got to go with Barks, you know? Yeah, Bar Barks is the best. I, I was trying to, I was just about to say that. It's good. That's its motto. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah, it's Bar correct. Barks is probably the best. A&W is also good. Yeah, I mean, listen, A and W and Mug. I'm not going to turn them down. They're they're root beer. I'll, I'll drink them. There's nothing wrong with them. But Barks just has that extra something. I don't know. M Mug is hit or miss. If if the, if it's not a, a good batch of syrup, it isn't good. But if it is a good batch of syrup, it's very good. And also, their logo is better than all the other root beer logos. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I like Who doesn't Barks. like a bull? I like Barks. I like Barks' logo. That's the barrel, right? Yeah, it's got the barrels. Yeah. Yeah, the for non glass bottle group here, we'll give the give the edge to uh, to Barks. But you know, they, they they get like high quality craft root beers, and that's that's the stuff. That's if I'm gonna get drink, and, and you know Stewart, Stewart's root beer is pretty good too. That's pretty much the only time I'm gonna drink a non diet soda, either orange soda yeah. or like a high quality glass bottle of root beer. That's the stuff. Yeah, that that would be my 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 pick as well. I think we're on the same boat there. I wouldn't have said that a year and a half ago, but at this point, that is the way I go. So, um, all right. Well, with that, I guess we're about to wrap up Dialectic number five, our hidden gems of the 80s. 
Uh, if you have any particular topics you want to hear us talk about next week, send us a message I thought you on Facebook. You wanted to do something related to live because we've talked about studio albums like this whole time. Yeah, we, we want to talk. We want to talk about the live shows. We could also talk about ranking the subgenres. If there's anything in particular you guys want to hear about, though, send us a message. We'll probably decide by Wednesday what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So anytime between now and then, if you've got an idea, shoot them our way, and we'll put them on the the list of ideas. Okie dokie. So with that. Uh, I'm Patrick. And I'm Nick. And we're, 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 we're out of this.